The contents of this interview, or from Awake and Empowered Expo LLC from Ethan Fox and Flower of Life Center for Human Evolution, is for informational purposes only and does not necessarily reflect the viewpoints held by these organizations or individuals. Always consult with your doctor or health professional before making any changes to your diet, lifestyle, or prescription drug use. Please understand that you assume all responsibility and risk for the use or misuse of this information. Hello and welcome to Awaken Power Radio. This is Ethan Fox. Today I have the pleasure of speaking with Sheriff Richard Mack, a champion of the U.S. Constitution and of the return to a common law system of justice. Richard Mack has been on a quest to unite sheriffs across America to uphold their oath to the Constitution. In our conversation, we also discuss his recent visit to the Bundy Ranch in Nevada where he witnessed firsthand how a people united can withstand the misuse of power by government. Richard, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for joining my call today. You're just doing amazing work with the movement toward constitutional law here in the United States and in, in all these various movements, uh, your name does come up and uh, is very well known and respected. Uh, I'd like to know, well first of all, thank you, welcome to the call. Thank you. And I'd like to know first a bit about your history, where where were you a sheriff and, and what compelled you to step out into the forefront of the constitutional movement, especially uh, if, if there are any specific life experiences or events that caused you to realize that you needed to take on this mission. Okay, well thanks, yeah. I was a sheriff of Graham County, like Graham Cracker. Uh, and that's southeast Arizona. And uh, my father was an FBI agent there for about 25 years. And then I had actually moved up to Utah to uh, go to school. I graduated and tried to get in the FBI. And then that never panned out. And while I was working my way through college, I was a part-time uh, meter maid, uh, parking enforcement officer uh, for the Provo Police Department. And I got to like the department, especially their sports programs. and. Uh, uh, I, I like the guys there. I like the uh, I like the involvement that I had with them, and and I hired on full time in 1979 as a patrol officer, and then I did uh, just about everything you can imagine in law enforcement, investigating murders and assaults and rapes and child abuse and bicycle theft, and I was a hostage negotiator, and I did a lot of public relations work. I was also a juvenile crime specialist and the school resource officer for the entire Provo School District, which had about 13 schools. And uh, I also served a stint, a uh, one-year stint as an undercover narcotics officer. And it, this really was a huge education for me. All of it was a huge education. And then in 1988, I decided to move home to Arizona and run for uh, Graham County Sheriff, and I was elected. And then in 1992, I was re-elected. And then in 1994, uh, because of some things, and you, you ask a very uh, pertinent question, what happened to me in my life that had me ready to get involved in the freedom movement and to actually end up suing the federal government? I sued the Clinton administration, and I won a case at the United States Supreme Court. It's the only time in history that a sheriff has ever done that, ever. And I'm not going to say I did it alone, because I didn't. But at the time, I was alone. When I first filed, I was alone for about uh, four weeks until... Sheriff Prince from Montana joined the lawsuit uh, a few weeks later, as I mentioned, and then uh, five other sheriffs from across the country joined the lawsuit. So it was only seven out of 3,100 sheriffs, seven, uh, uh, joined this fight and stood up against the federal government. And uh, you need to remember, we won this lawsuit. We won a landmark decision at the United States Supreme Court on the issue of state sovereignty. And we sued over the Brady Bill. The Brady Bill was the first time in history that the federal government commandeered the office of sheriff for federal bidding under a threat of arrest if we failed to comply. So what happened to me that I was ready to do this lawsuit? Well, uh, it, you got to go back to when I was a rookie cop. And when I first served undercover uh, in 1982, after I finished that, I started questioning a lot of what we did in law enforcement including the drug war. And why did I need to risk my life to try to stop people from smoking marijuana uh, and a few other drugs that really weren't as dangerous as alcohol that was totally legal? And so I, I really started to, to delve into those subjects and really researched it. <clears throat> and I started to ask, why do we even have government? Why do we have cops? And 
why are we doing the things that we do in law enforcement? Like the most, the mo the, the, the most we did in law enforcement was writing tickets. I mean, we spent so much time and effort writing tickets. And I even started to question that. And especially uh, no seatbelt tickets. And I, I uh, when I was sheriff, I told my de deputies that we would not write tickets for that. Uh, we would still talk, stop, talk, uh, stop people and talk to them, but we would not write tickets. If we lived in a free country, people would make their own choices about the usage of a seatbelt. And so I, I told my deputies we wouldn't write tickets, and we didn't. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, but the really the thing that happened to me after I finished my undercover assignment, I was uh, out writing tickets one day, and a lady ran a stop sign right in front of me, and she's just about to change my life forever. She didn't see me, although I was right next. I was the only living thing in a marked police car within a hundred. 50 yards of the intersection and she didn't see me because she was so preoccupied with trying to settle her five or six kids down that she lost her uh, she lost track of where she was on the road ran the stop sign looked over at me and she realized what she had done and kind of threw her arms up in the air and uh, I went up to write her the ticket and I'm writing her the ticket and I'm just finishing filling out the ticket I signed my name and put my serial number and I looked down at this poor, dejected, depressed woman. Some of her kids were still uh, crying and roughhousing. And, uh, I was really impressed and touched with this woman's situation. I knew that she didn't mean to do this, and yet I'm writing her a ticket anyway. I knew she never intended to harm anyone, but yet I'm going to fine her anyway. And it was obvious that this woman didn't have the money to pay a $5 ticket, let alone the $45 ticket that this was back at the time. And I asked myself a few questions. I said, Mac, is there anything you're doing here that's helping this family? Is there anything you're doing here that's making this a better place to live? And are you bringing honor to the badge you wear on your chest? Well, I didn't like any of the answers. And I didn't like what I was, and I didn't like what I had become. And I just handed this lady back her license and registration, walked away with the ticket. I never gave her the ticket. And I went back to the police station and tore the ticket up, and I said, you've got to find out who you are and why you're a cop. And in searching that out, I ran smack in the face of the oath of office. And how I did that was st still just an amazing miracle because I never paid any attention to the oath of office and now I was and I read the Constitution over and over and I still maintain to this day there is no way a cop or a chief of police or a sheriff or anyone else in government can keep their oath of office without reading the document they promised to uphold and defend within that oath and so I started studying and I read the Constitution, especially the Bill of Rights, over and over. And then I started reading things about the Founding Fathers because I wanted to know their intent. And you know, it would take maybe five minutes for any high school student or anyone uh, anywhere in this country to determine what the Founding Fathers really intended when it came to the, their intent regarding the right of the people to keep and bear arms. And I never was into guns, I never was a hunter, and I still am not. But when you find out that guns equate to freedom and you realize that gun control in the United States of America is against the law. And I've even written books about that now that I was so impressed with the research I had done. I wrote a book back in 1994, the very year I filed the lawsuit against the Brady Bill. Um, the book title was From My Cold Dead Fingers, Why America Needs Guns. And uh, so, uh, a very powerful title, uh, and then I've written several books since then, and my most popular book, again, ba basically just self-published, is The County Sheriff, America's Last Hope, and it's done about 100,000 copies nationwide. And this is starting to change the political landscape regarding how we run for sheriff in this country. I mean, I get calls, dozens of calls every month from people who want to run as a constitutional 
candidate for sheriff anywhere. Uh, we have them in California. We have them in New York and every way and every state in between. We have a horrible example of what's going on when you get rid of sheriffs, and that's in Connecticut. We even have sheriffs in New York who are defending the Second Amendment, but you don't have any in Connecticut right next door because Connecticut got rid of sheriffs back about 15 years ago. The office of sheriff was there for decades, or, or probably centuries, but yet they voted the office of sheriff out. Those sheriffs acquiesced and said, went along with it because they were offered high paying jobs with the state. And so they said, yeah, we'll take the money and run. And they did. And it was the biggest mistake they ever made because now they have gun control and gun confiscation and door to door confiscation being considered there and there's nobody to stop it. And so this is what I really fear is going to happen across the country and sheriffs are going to have to decide whose side they're on. And so the gun control issue is the key component of everything we're talking about here in saving our country and making sure that the Constitution is protected and uh, perpetuated. It, it must continue or America will die. And we're actually watching America die now. And so I, 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 my message to sheriffs is you can save America. You can stop the abuses going on within your county. You can make your county a constitutional county. That you enforce the Bill of Rights and that you put the federal government on notice that the Bill of Rights will be strictly enforced in your county. What, who does that hurt? Why would we be afraid of that? It's what we promised to do when we took the office. The oath of office requires that we uh, swear allegiance to the Constitution and that we will uphold and defend it, that we will obey it, that we will enforce it. And ultimately, who's supposed to enforce the Tenth Amendment? State sovereignty is a job of each of the uh, political appointments within the state. Every sheriff, every dog catcher, every teacher, anyone who works for government, city, city councils, city managers, the mayor, the county commissioners, state reps, state senators, and the governor. Those are the people who should be defending state sovereignty, enforcing state sovereignty, and making sure that the federal government does not overstep their boundaries, as described within Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. The, the federal government has only discrete enumerated powers, and that's exactly what my Supreme Court decision says. And it even says who's supposed to make sure the federal government stays within those enumerated powers. It's the state. Well, the state can't do it by itself. The geography of your state cannot enforce anything. But the sheriffs and local officials can and should. So I know that was a, a kind of a long uh, part of your question, a long answer to your question, but uh, it's the truth and that's where I'm at and all of that lawsuit and all of the work I've done in nearly 20 years of law enforcement have brought me to the point I am today in reaching out to create more constitutional sheriffs all across this country. I've heard a lot of different theories on this. Obviously you're somebody who has a unique background in this in this particular area. Um, so in, in your opinion who or what is the intention behind the federal government or who is it that is responsible for this takeover of the various sheriffs around the country and what what's the intention behind it? Well uh, certainly uh, the Brady Bill was a, a test point I think for the federal government uh, to test if the sheriffs would really stand against the federal government taking over their offices and I think they were pleased with the result that only you know, seven or eight sheriffs did this. One sheriff said, I'm not going to go along with the Brady Bill, I'm not going to do it, but I'm not going to join the lawsuit either. And that's actually what we prefer, especially today. Uh, the the uh, stance for liberty is not because we sue, it's because we do. And that's where we're at. We're telling sheriffs, stop suing and start doing. Tell the federal government you're not going to allow them to do that in your county, whether it's the IRS, uh, illegally seizing bank accounts and putting liens on property, whatever. The IRS is a criminal organization. They have a rap sheet longer than my arm and yours put together. They've been um, caught committing crimes for several decades, being used as hitmen by uh, the presidents. Uh, FDR did it, uh, Clinton did it, Nixon did it, uh, and uh, certainly Obama is doing it. Uh, we have those uh, those evidences all, all across America. 
They're doing it. So how do we stop it? Who's going to protect the American people from IRS crimes? Is it Washington, D.C.? Is it Congress? Is it the, the Appropriations Committee? Is it uh, Senator Cruz, Senator Lee, Senator Paul? Uh, who? Who's going to protect them? The president? <laughs> what a joke. No. The sheriff is going to have to do it. The federal government is not going to do it. We already know they're not going to do it. They don't even know how to balance their own budget. And they refuse to balance the budget. They could, re they could balance the budget, but they refuse. They could uh, secure our borders. They are required by law and the Constitution to protect our borders from invasion. Are they going to do that? No, they're not going to. Why? Because they want to play political patty cake with the Hispanic vote. The Republicans want to get more of it, and the Democrats want to maintain it. And so they're not going to uh, uh, aggravate uh, the Hispanic voters. And so that's why. They are willing to compromise our security as a nation for their own political gain. And that's how far off we've gotten. So can the sheriffs and the states protect their own borders? Of course. And they can and they should. It, the word delegated is, is in the Tenth Amendment. We need to remember that. The states delegated to the federal government certain powers. If they don't do it right, we can undelegate those powers and take them back. A boss can delegate. Uh, sometimes uh, they say that the state surrendered powers over to the federal government. That's not true. We did not surrender anything. The specific word used in the Bill of Rights and in the Tenth Amendment where it talks about state sovereignty is we delegated to the new uh, federal government certain powers and certain obligations. And we might as well go over those right now. In, uh, in the Constitution, the federal government is assigned five law enforcement authorities. Anything outside those five must be what? Tenth Amendment referred to the states or to the people. All law enforcement powers are within the states and cities and counties except for these five. Let's go over. One is treason. They are in charge of investigating treason. The FBI is allowed and required to investigate treason. Don't you wish they would start doing that in Washington, D.C.? Boy, those guys would never get done. And then two, counterfeiting. Three, felonies committed on the high seas or piracies. Four, laws against nations or treaties. So, for instance, if, if we had a treaty with Mexico and one of our citizens violated a treaty or went down there illegally, whatever, isn't that funny? Um, the FBI would investigate that. And five, as I mentioned early, they're, earlier, they're required to protect our borders. The federal government is required by law to protect our borders. If they don't do that, yes, absolutely, the states can do that themselves. So those are the only five authorities assigned to the federal government within the Constitution. The Tenth Amendment is very clear. All powers not delegated to the federal government are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. So th those five is all again. How many authorities, law enforcement assignments have, has the federal government stolen or usurped? It's probably two to five thousand. And uh, so where would the federal government be allowed then constitutionally drug enforcement to conduct the drug war, which has been a farce also? But where would they be constitutionally allowed to do that? At the border. That's where they're given uh, jurisdiction. That's where they have it. And throughout the country or throughout the world, no, they do, not have, they do not have that. If they can work internationally to try to stop the drugs from coming in uh, and across the border, I guess that might be allowed. Um, but that's it. That's it. That's all they get. So most of the police agencies within the federal government are all unconstitutional. And if we return to the Constitution, that will save our country. We're not in trouble today because we follow the Constitution too strictly. <laughs> in fact, our federal uh, servants, if you will, uh, say all the time that the Constitution doesn't apply anymore. They have to make up excuses as to why they don't follow the Constitution or they look like traitors. And so they don't want to look like a traitor, so they have to make up excuses why they will not follow the Constitution. And we are experiencing our, our own demise 
because we are allowing our own federal government to destroy our own constitution. If you destroy the foundation, the rest of the building will fall, and that's where we're at today. Now, police departments are corporate entities, right? Are, are sheriff's departments also corporate entities now? I know they some weren't are, before, right? Some are, but uh, you know the sheriffs don't know that, and they're not they're not uh, really uh, knowledgeable enough about their own offices or their own powers or responsibilities to even address that issue. So we do try, we do teach uh, about all of that, and their responsibility first and foremost is to the Constitution. It is to protect liberty. It is to protect rights. They are the defense. They are the last line in the sand against all criminals, both foreign and domestic. They are required by law to put that first. The corporate interests or the corporation that they're uh, a part of now, whether they uh, wittingly or unwittingly, that does not come first. Constitution, God's law, liberty, all come first. In your opinion, what is the purpose of the county police department in comparison to the sheriff? Why do we need police departments? You really, uh, you really don't need them. There should only be one police agency in the county, and that's the sheriff's office. When the city started incorporating, they decided that they wanted their own police forces, which adds a lot of power and allows them to collect fines and traffic tickets and all that. So they wanted to be able to reinforce their own budgets with a police department. But uh, uh, I, I certainly appeal to the police departments in this country, and we want chiefs and sheriffs uh, to work together. But uh, I will tell the truth about that, and I've told that to many chiefs, and some of them are even working with us, and they know that it, it is true. Uh, most of the chiefs of police uh, know the importance of the sheriff and know that we need them. Uh, but there is a movement in this country to move away from sheriffs and to diminish the role of the sheriffs and not allow them to make arrests or have them part of true law enforcement. They just want them serving papers. Well, constables are in charge of serving papers for courts, and so we really don't need two constables, and that's really what the states in the east are doing, Massachusetts and Rhode Island and, and uh, Connecticut, of course, obviously, they got rid of sheriffs, and there's several others along the eastern seaboard that are diminishing the role and power of the sheriff, and it's a very dangerous trend. So it sounds like police departments are really um, established for the sake of... Um commerce not necessarily for law enforcement as their primary objective is that fair well they call it law enforcement but their primary objective is to do what they're told you know they just follow orders the, the chief of police reports to the city council and the town manager uh, he doesn't report to the people the sheriff on the other hand is the only elected law enforcement officer in the county and anywhere in the country he reports to the people and the first three words of our constitution are we the people. And all power comes from us, from we the people. That so many people uh, in this country, pundits and journalists say that, yeah, the reason that the people are in charge is because we vote. No, <laughs> that's not the only reason that people are in charge. We are uh, in charge of all nullification through, yes, voting, jury nullification, and we need to realize that. People in this country don't know about jury notification, but it's an absolute principle that they must know about. And so we are armed in this country so that if we ever need to take over our country again, just as our founders did in 1776, then we can. And that's why it's so alarming to see how many of our government officials think that they have the authority to take our guns away or to regulate how we keep and bear arms or regulate our ammunition and magazines and what kind of guns we can own and all that. They have absolutely no regulatory authority over um, the right of the people to keep and bear arms and how we do that. Uh, and so, yeah, it's all gotten so bass backwards uh, in this country, but we the people bestow all power. And that's why the sheriff is the most powerful law enforcement officer in the country, because he reports directly to them. He doesn't report to another bureaucrat. He doesn't report to other politicians. He reports only to the people, and that's the way it was designed, and that's why we are called a constitutional republic, because the people choose, not other government officials or politicians or bureaucrats, and that's what they're trying to do to diminish sheriffs in this country. 
Yeah, I want to switch gears a little bit, and we'll come back to the sheriff discussion a little bit. But uh, you were just at the Clive and Bundy Ranch, right? Are you still there? No, I'm not there, but uh, yes, I was there for a few days with my son, Jimmy, and it was an amazing, amazing situation. You probably know better than anyone. There are a lot of different theories going around about what is really taking place behind the scenes. Can you tell me, from what you know, uh, what is the real situation there and, and what is the reason why the Bureau of Land Management is trying to seize the land? Well, first of all, every American should be scared to death as to what happened there. That, the, that a military operation comes in to collect a bill, to collect a debt. This was all over collecting a debt. This, you know, there's a proper way to collect debts, and, and sheriffs have to actually be part of that sometimes. The sheriff in this particular case said he had no authority to interfere, that he has no authority to keep his oath of office, that he has no authority to keep the peace, that he has no authority to protect and serve the people of his county. How utterly absurd and how utterly going along with what the federal government wants sheriffs to believe. And so this uh, sheriff there actually went along with the federal government. And that's why they have all these bribes and, and grants and all these government freebies so that sheriffs will be their buddies and friends and on their side. And the federal grants are absolutely an, uh, an abomination. Do not take them. Do not ask for them and do not associate with people who want to give you bribes. Anybody knows in law enforcement there's no free lunch. There's no free money. If, if somebody's giving you money, you got to ask yourself why. Why would a, a, a kidnapper go up to a kid and say, here's some money and I've got more in the car? Why? Because they want something and they want to do something bad to you. Same thing with the federal government. The rules don't change. Somebody comes up and offers you free money, well, that's the reason why. So this sheriff goes along with the federal grants and federal bribes. And why is it, what every American should ask themselves, why is it that the federal government is destroying the ranching industry? Not just in Nevada, but in the entire West. They've done it in Oregon, done it in California, done it in Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and now really bad in Nevada. In Clark County, Clark County is where Las Vegas is. That's the big calling card for Clark County, Las Vegas. But Clark County is huge. Uh, Nevada is huge. There's only 17 counties in all of Nevada. And so the counties are all huge. Ne ne uh, Clark County is huge. And they've had 53 ranchers there just uh, a couple of decades ago. 53 different ranchers. They've all been run out of business by the overregulation and the grazing fees and all the other things that the federal government does to make that business impossible. And the Bundy family is the last rancher left. That's it. And I've heard some national radio and local radio shows that have actually said, the government's just doing their job, and this unlawful man has not paid his fees. So we definitely got some problems there. We need to be on the side of the Bundys. We need to be on the side of the ranching industry. And we need to ask the question, why are they destroying the ranching industry in this country. What is that about? And then, then the federal government comes in and they say, well, we're from the federal government. We, we respect your constitutional rights. So they make a corral over here. And if you go in that corral, you're allowed free speech and peaceable assembly. If you're outside that and you do anything wrong that the federal government determines is wrong, they'll arrest you. If you try outside that corral to exercise freedom of speech, they'll arrest you. And in fact, they did that with one guy. So the, the point is clear that this is a freedom issue. This is the survival of the uh, ranching industry. And why is it that the federal government is so hell-bent on getting this land? Well, they want control of it. And yes, Harry Reid and his son have a deal with the Chinese to put in a solar plant and solar uh, panels. And then Harry Reid says nothing while they're having a military siege there. He's not worried about anybody getting killed. He makes no comments, but it ends peacefully. And he wants to call every one of us there a domestic terrorist. Well, who went in there with a bunch of rifles and uh, high-powered rifles and military equipment? And who went in there and slaughtered a bunch of cattle belonging to the Bundys? It was almost like 
the abused the the abuser you know well if I can't have you then nobody can where's anybody with within the federal government saying that's against the law and they spent nine hundred sixty six thousand dollars on a contract to some cowboys to go get the cattle that's almost a million dollars where I went to school and they said that the bill originally was a million if they had just saved that and used that the bills paid then with all the military equipment and overtime to the officers that were there and the hired mercenaries that were employed uh, they're into this thing about three and a half million dollars so what's the big deal and why are they spending so much money to get a original three hundred thousand dollar debt man everybody in the country should be asking themselves that question so tell me were there a lot of militia present at the Bundy Ranch when you were there well all of us are militia whether we like it or not you know uh, so yes but most of the there was just there were teachers who came there were state legislators and I'm really proud of the contingency of the state Arizona state legislators that came there there was about 12 of them that went there to see it for themselves even a congressman from Arizona Paul Gosar but we needed people to go there to stop it and I believe that all the people that went men women uh, from all walks of life from all over the country uh, state assemblywoman Michelle Fiore from Nevada was really fighting all this uh, uh, the Hage family who had fought this before uh, again this is nothing new and we even had uh, a sheriff do this in Nye County who he, when he told uh, the federal government you're not going to get the cattle from the Hage family I'm not going to allow you to take the cattle I'm not going to allow you to destroy their 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 ranch and the uh, the BLM told him, well, we're going to bring back a SWAT team and we're going to take them. And he goes, I've got one too. And this is a sheriff, Sheriff Tony DeMeo, standing uh, and doing the right thing for his people. Could have really been messy. Could have even got arrested. But he stood for freedom. For those people who don't understand, what exactly would you describe as the militia? Is that a... Is that a constitutionally appointed um, or recognized uh, group of people? Uh, what exactly is that? Well, if you read Article 1, Section 8, and if you read the Second Amendment, it talks about the militia. And the militia is mentioned in the Constitution probably three or four times. And, and it makes it clear that they are a power, very powerful entity. And it also makes it clear uh, that uh, the people are the militia. And that's why in the Second Amendment there is no contradiction where it says a well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state. Comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Well, when you realize that the people are the militia, then there's no contradiction in there. The liberals and liars in government and the media want you to believe that that's talking about the military, the army, well, uh, or the National Guard. Well, there was no National Guard until 1906, so the Founding Fathers developed the Second Amendment over 120 years before that. So the, the people that say it's talking about the National Guard is just not true. We the people are the militia. And if you look up uh, the uh, United States Code, it defines it as every able-bodied male from 17 to 45. And then the sheriff also has the authority to call out the militia or the posse. And so many people think that the sheriff and the posse came from the Old West. That's not true for either one. But the sheriff does have the authority to call out the posse or the militia in defense of uh, the county and keeping the peace within the county and that's something that's been there for uh, again centuries and so uh, the militia groups that uh, came out there uh, they certainly were there but I would not say that they were the the majority of the people that came there of the six seven eight hundred people I saw there it was just regular people just regular citizens from again there were some from Florida there were some from uh, New Hampshire uh, from all over the country, uh, a lot from, uh, of course, the western states, but it was just concerned citizens who wanted to make sure there was no repeat of a Waco or Ruby Ridge type situation here, and the people of this country just don't want the federal government to kill innocent people again, as they did in Waco and Ruby Ridge, and that's why we went, that's what, that's why my son and I went. So what's the current situation there, and, and where do you see it going at this point? Uh, I still don't trust, <laughs> go figure, I don't trust the federal government, I don't trust the BLM, anybody that can uh, do this type of overreach, just the, it was so, uh, the the punishment just didn't fit the crime, and, and the movement there with military 
equipment to go after the Bundys the, the way they did uh, was just so alarming uh, that it, it scares me. And, and so, uh, yeah, the situation still really hasn't changed. We still think, even though that they've moved off the Bundy Ranch, that they're still close by. And we think that they're going to do some other type of raid. Probably just instead of this time aimed at the cattle, aimed at the Bundys. And so I, I don't trust any of them. I don't trust this administration. I don't trust uh, a lot of the leaders who claim to support the Constitution but yet did nothing to stop this horrible situation and to protect life and the liberty of this great family. And I'll, I'll add this too. I, I know the Bundys. I'm, I've known Mr. Bundy and a couple of his sons for quite a while. Um, this is the first time I've met all his family was when they invited me over for dinner uh, Monday after our press conference. This is one of the best families, if not seriously, and I'm not exaggerating, the best family in America that I've ever met. And I'm including my own. Um, my children don't get along very well. The Bundy's family and their children, they do get along. And they love each other. They have like 12 kids, uh, you know, they've got daughters-in-law and sons-in-law. They all love Mr. and Mrs. Bundy. They all get along. They all support them in this. They know the truth about this. They are such a united and loyal and together family. They're prayerful. They're faithful. And when I asked Mrs. Bundy, when we were having lunch there, I said, what, what are you doing to handle this? Uh, how are you handling this okay? Why do you have such a positive attitude and a smile on your face? And she goes, I'm at total peace with this entire situation. I'm at peace. And you could tell that she was. And you could tell what a great person she was. These are good, honest, law-abiding Christian people. And they only want to be left alone. Do we do that in America anymore? Do we have a government that will just leave people alone? They have not committed a crime. They have not hurt another person. They need to be left alone. Now, other than what you've already stated, why do you suppose that sheriffs like Sheriff Gillespie, for that matter, are um, on the side of the BLM other than the side of the people that they're elected to serve? Do they just not understand their oath of office? Is that really the bottom line? I, I think there's some that don't want to understand the oath of office. I think there's some that don't want to know and understand what the Constitution really requires because they're so used to doing things their way and way, the way we've always done them. And uh, it takes, it takes a, a additional work to do what I'm proposing. For sheriffs to keep the federal government out of their counties, that is going to be uh, some extra work. And they don't want to do that. They just, you know, they just want to kick in doors and write the tickets and uh, arrest the potheads and, and forget about it. And uh, they, they have forgotten one thing, that liberty is more important than any other thing we could possibly do. Protecting God-given rights, protecting the liberties our country was founded upon, there's nothing more important than that. And sheriffs just don't look at themselves as the protectors of liberty. And that's where we come in, the CSPOA. That's what we are dedicating our lives to. And our entire goal is to make sure sheriffs do understand that. Sheriff Gillespie has been invited to our conferences that have been held right there in Vegas, right in his backyard. He's never uh, taken the time to attend. He's made excuses as to why he can't, why he won't. But if he had attended, I think he would have responded this, to this entire situation differently. We, we have about 3,100 sheriffs in this country. We're reaching out to all of them. We hope to get about 800 of them on board. We would like to have about a third that really believe in the Constitution and enforce the Constitution. And if we get, we, we of course want all of them, but we know we're not going to do that. So our goal is to get a, a right about 1,000. If we have 1,000 sheriffs that do what Sheriff Rogers has done, Sheriff Palmer has done, Sheriff Finch has done, Sheriff Christopher has done, uh, we will take America back one county at a time. We can, st we can restore uh, American liberty. We can restore the Constitution, sheriff by sheriff, county by county, and state by state. That's the only solution we have left. And how far along are you on reaching that goal right now? So far, we've had about 300 sheriffs attend our conventions and conferences. Uh, some of those it didn't take. We have others who haven't attended who have expressed uh, a lot of support for what we're doing. So we believe that we have, you know, anywhere from a little over 200, perhaps, that are seriously constitutional sheriffs. Of those, we have told 
you have to do more. You have to take stronger stands. And some of them have taken that seriously. Some of them are still being trying to be careful with it. Some are still being politically correct. They want to protect their position. They want to still keep their jobs. They want to get reelected. And we just don't have much patience with those anymore. And so we're still trying to define how many members we have and how many are really going to do this. Uh, we have actually uh, turned away from some sheriffs who, who have claimed to be constitutional sheriffs and we've actually fired them from our organization, if you will. Uh, we've terminated their memberships uh, and we don't support them anymore. We invite them to come back. Uh, but, uh, you know, they have to, you know, sort of repent, change uh, what they've been doing and realize who the real enemy is and realize what their position as sheriff really is. And that's why we're doing what we're doing. To tell you an exact number, we don't know. But I want you to know that every citizen can join. And we need every citizen in this country, uh, a part of your group and that's watching this program. We need you on board. We need your help. We can't do this without we the people. And the sheriff works for you. He must hear from you and a lot of you. And tell him you want him to be a constitutional sheriff. Ask him if he's read my book. Make sure he has the book. The County Sheriff, America's Last Hope. So do you have a reason to believe that these numbers will increase in the time ahead? And what, what, what gives you that confidence, if that's the case? And uh, do you have any initiatives planned specifically to, to do that? Yeah, we do. We're reaching out to the sheriffs in lots of different ways. And we're still having, we want to have regional conventions. Instead, we've had three in Las Vegas. We've had one in St. Charles, Missouri. We want to go out to New York and have them. We want to go out to Michigan. We want to go out to Pennsylvania, all across the country and have more meetings and have more people involved, have more sheriffs involved and just do more training to where the sheriffs can see what we're talking about is lawful, constitutional, historically correct and something that they, that they realize they have to do. We still get calls uh, every week from sheriffs. We get letters from sheriffs, emails from sheriffs who want to know more, who want to do more about this, who want to understand the office and their responsibility to protect people. If it wasn't for that, I would have already stopped this. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to waste my time on something that's not working. But uh, we have made tremendous strides. We've had miracles happen, and I mean miracles. But we are very concerned that this isn't bigger, better, and faster right now. I don't think we have a lot of time and I, uh, this government is getting more and more out of control and the Bundy situation is more evidence of that. We had a governor that could have stopped that. We had uh, in Governor Sandoval in Nevada. We had a sheriff that could have stopped it and Sheriff Gillespie. He didn't do it. Uh, but when he finally did show up, when the, when the Bundys actually put him into a corner, he showed up and things started going better immediately. So uh, Sheriff Gillespie, when he said he didn't have the authority to interfere, obviously was wrong. Uh, he may have even been lying about that. Uh, but we believe that he was just wrong, and he did show up. Uh, it was a little bit late, but when he did, like I said, things started turning around. In your opinion, what is the problem with the current governmental structure, and, and if you had your way, what would you replace it with? Uh, there's nothing wrong with our constitutional form of government. Uh, it's just that it's, it has been bastardized by those in authority. Uh, James Madison said we would lose more uh, freedom and liberty from those in power than by uh, sudden usurpations. But he claimed that those uh, uh, encroachments would be silent and gradual. Well, they're not silent and gradual anymore. So the only thing we want is for the Constitution is speci and more specifically the Bill of Rights to be enforced by the sheriffs. We will take America back if we do that. If we don't, I don't believe there's going to be any recourse. I don't believe there's any other way out. The sheriffs have to be on board. We're not going to fix uh, this huge catastrophe in Washington, D.C. Why? They're the ones that have caused it. And never has it been in history where the tyrant stopped his own tyranny, stopped his own abuse. And so uh, we hold no hope in Washington, but we can make uh, Washington, D.C. irrelevant. We can go along with them when they follow the Constitution and completely go against them when they don't. So yes, we have a lot of work to do. If, if, this, if this thing fails, then uh, I believe we have one other peaceful remedy 
within our reach, and that is that we all have got to move to two or three different counties, all of us, you, everybody, the patriots, we have got to decide, and we've got to do whatever it takes to move to the same county. And we have our own sheriffs, we have our own county commissioners, and everybody in those positions will be constitutional, uh, will be dedicated to the principles that America was founded upon, and we, every police officer, everybody in government, will enforce the Bill of Rights. There will be no entitlement programs, there will be no uh, welfare programs, there will be no uh, federal income tax. We will be true Americans following the law, taking care of each other, and uh, living a constitutional form of government. We're hoping to set those up now uh, with constitutional sheriffs and that it's spread out from there. But the people have to be involved in that process. If these two things fail, I don't see anything else. I really don't. Now, there's a huge movement in the United States and actually worldwide to reinstate common law. And in the U.S. in particular, one of the ways that that's uh, being done is through the establishment of common law grand juries in counties throughout the country. Do you have an opinion on common law as a system itself, and, and what do you think about the grand jury concept? The Constitution is common law, and uh, the Bill of Rights actually mentions the common law, I believe, in the Seventh Amendment. Uh, and we just need uh, common sense and the law applied together, and that's what common law is. If the Constitution is being enforced, we will have common law again in this country. And the sheriff uh, is a vital part of what you're talking about. You can't have common law juries uh, without the sheriff involved. And so I also believe that the sheriff as a constitutional uh, enforcer and a constitutional sheriff, if you have that in your county, the common law jury thing uh, it will either be made irrelevant or unnecessary. So if the sheriff is already there enforcing the constitution and being a constitutional officer, then um, I don't think we'll have to worry about that. I think you'll agree that uh, you would love to have that kind of a government underneath a, con a constitutional sheriff. Tell me about the CSPOA and the Constitutional Convention that you did uh, this past year, I believe it was, and yeah. what exactly took place there and what's the nature of this 2014 resolution that you had uh, the uh, attendees sign? Well, great, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, the, the resolution that we created was done by constitutional sheriffs who were in attendance. And there were a few other constitutional uh, officers. There were mayors and state reps and constitutional scholars and just citizens, uh, but very few citizens. Most of them were sheriffs. Uh, and I sat in the audience during this convention, th this conference. Uh, in the morning we had speakers and there were only five and then that's it. The entire afternoon was dedicated to the development of this resolution. And it basically has eight steps that require the federal government to follow the Constitution. All this, the, in fact, the only thing this does, if you read it, I mean, it's available on our website. We want everybody to get it. Everybody can sign it. But more importantly, we want you to take it to your sheriff and ask him to sign it, send it back to us. That's what we want. We want every public official, any cop, any trooper, anybody at all to sign this. We've already got uh, about 300 people who have signed it. Most of those are public officials uh, and about 60, 70 sheriffs who have signed it so far. Uh, every now and again we just get a, a letter from a constable or a sheriff or a city councilman who have seen it and sign it and send it in, and mail it in to us. We're thrilled with that sort of thing. But everybody in this country needs to know about that resolution because all it does, again it's a resolution, and it has all that, you know, the whereas's and all of that in there, that say, we won't tolerate, number three says, we will no longer tolerate the federal government conducting uh, warrantless investigations or probable cause-less investigations on citizens, like random audits by the IRS. We will not tolerate any investigation against a citizen that doesn't have probable cause. Well, that's what random audits by the IRS are. We asked who will protect the people from those sort of things. The sheriff. He can go tell the IRS, you're not going to do that in my county anymore. There's even things he can do to follow up with bank seizures of, of the people's bank accounts. 
So yes, there's some things we can do. And if we don't try, then we have failed at the very beginning. And so this resolution is simply a way to put the federal government on notice by your local sheriff, by your local officials, by you, the people, to the federal government saying, we demand that you follow the Constitution. And that's all this resolution does. It basically puts the federal government on notice that you better follow the Constitution, specifically the Bill of Rights, when you come into our county. And I did not do this. I specifically sat in the audience and prayed that some sheriff in the audience would take control of the meeting and raise up and be the leader. And sure enough, Sheriff Joey Kyle from Missouri did just that. And I was really proud of him, and I thank the good Lord for the answer to those prayers. And this resolution came about that afternoon. A, a very solemn, sacred prayer was offered by one of the guys in the audience. And we came together on this, and it was very inspirational, very patriotic, and I love that day. And I will tell you, the most powerful patriotic spiritual moment in my entire career and entire years that I've been in this movement for freedom in the last 20, 25 years was at the Bundy Ranch. I felt the same thing when we did this resolution, but I felt it even stronger at the Bundy Ranch. When we were watching those cows being released by those patriotic cowboys and cowgirls, it was so inspiring, so reverent. You could have heard a pin drop on the desert sand. And we all had tears rolling down our cheeks. Everybody hugged each other. It was like we were watching uh, the new formation of American liberty. And we won that day. We hardly ever win, but we won that day. And I believe we won January 24th of this year when we put this resolution together. It was really miraculous. The Bundy Ranch scene was really miraculous. And that's, that's what we're about. Forming more miracles, getting more sheriffs on board, and restoring liberty county by county, sheriff by sheriff, and state by state. Uh, we're looking forward to having you out here at our expo this August 15th through the 17th and of 2014. And we are planning on inviting as many sheriffs as we can get to come to the event. Uh, just to attend for free and be a part of this, and, um, and and you're welcome to have that resolution there if you'd like. Oh, absolutely. Okay, yeah, because we'd love to make this a part of your movement and help you do what you're doing as well. So let's talk about that as we as we move in that direction. But can you give me an idea of what are some of the topics you'll you'll speak about at this uh, at your lecture? Oh, absolutely. Uh, state sovereignty, of course, and my Supreme Court decision that reinforces everything I've told you today. I have an absolute uh, piece of evidence. I have absolute proof. That's the word I want. I have absolute proof that what I've been saying is backed up by the United States Supreme Court in the Mac Prince v. U.S. decision. And uh, I'll have that decision with me. I'll be able to share it with people. I'll show excerpts from that in my PowerPoint presentation and then we offer a solution and uh, we don't want people to leave without knowing that there is hope and there is hope and uh, the solution is in your own hands the solution is in your own county and you need to work with your sheriff you need to gain a relationship with your sheriff and we talk about that and we talk about sheriffs who are already doing this and we'll show proof positive that what we're doing is one working and two that needs more attention and dedication from all of us in this country. Okay, sounds great. And uh, if people want to learn more about your work or get in touch with you, what, what would be the best way for them to do that? It's all at the website, cspoa.org. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Sheriff Mack. I'm looking forward to meeting you in person this August, and I'm sure we'll be in touch in the meantime to, uh, to work out the details of your presentation. Super, thanks Thank a lot. Thank you so much.